have to misplace the implication. There it is. Almighty God, we pray this day for your ever-enduring guidance. We ask you to cloak us in wisdom and fortitude that we may dispense our knowledge and facts intelligently among all of humanity of whom we serve. Amen. With no closed session, we're going to move to agenda approval, addition and or position. Second. Mr. Hammond moves. Mr. Albaugh seconds. I'd like to close this meeting in honor of Fred Zelke today, the old virgin passed away. So if you could, is that all right, gentlemen, if we amend it? Yes, yes, and I'd also like to adjourn the meeting of memory of John Thompson. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will move to public comment. I have two speaker cards, and then if you wish to speak, you just raise your hands. We'll start with Chris Beach. She followed the dogs to his home. He said, yes, the dogs belonged to his son, Tonka, and that he would have to have the dogs put down as this wasn't the first time his dogs had done this. The deputy took the information over the phone, gave a case number, and that was all. Nobody went to their house. Those dogs weren't taken. Since that incident of September 12th, these four dogs have killed another neighbor's cat as well as another one that I cared for two weeks ago. 
Robert, Jolene, and Thomas four dogs, as well as two pit bull mix, still running loose and have been seen at the school bus stops. Those are the letters of concern I brought you. Please, before a child's name gets added to this list, someone needs to do their job and respond to our area and take care of these dogs and cite the owners. And P.S., on my way here this morning, as I was leaving, driving down Arlington Road, I obtained a picture of two pit bull mixed dogs running freely in the neighborhood. This is one right here. If you'd like to see it up close, I can show it to you. Uh, we're going to accept your word on the matter, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for speaking to me. Do I have anybody else wish to speak during public comment? I'd like to respond to, to those comments if I could. I just was made aware of that Thursday by Sandy that this was going on and I immediately contacted our CAO who started the actions to take care of that. Nobody called me or, you know, if you guys have issues like that, let me know right away. Let's not let this thing hang out for two months. It's going to take care of it. I think we had two or three other occasions that we took dogs from Hobson. Bob, am I right? At least two. He doesn't have any trouble today. Yeah, and he since passed away, which I didn't know until today. So, seriously, if you guys have issues, call me. You know, you see me all the time. Oh, there we go. Thank you. We do take your concerns seriously, so thank you. I think that uh, the 
the safety of workers out there and the safety of the general public is worthy of taking this agenda item if you return to us when we actually agendize it and we can discuss measures. Some of it might just be public information pointing out to people the dangers inherent in allowing their trash to flow freely out the back of their vehicles. Um, but it is something worthy of discussion in the future. We can't discuss it too deeply today because right. it's not agendized, but we appreciate Caltrans coming forward with any safety measures for 395. So uh, I think it's, what do you gentlemen think? Is it worthy of? I, I believe so. I think we could do more than So hopefully before the end of the year, we'll invite you back and you'll leave your information with the clerk and we'll have this discussion. Perfect. Thank and you. Scott, we kind of, we had a media transportation committee meeting yesterday and uh, Mike Logan from Caltrans said that uh, the traffic was decreasing on 395. The traffic was decreasing. The speeds have increased 465 percent. Talking to the CHP, they tickets over 100 miles an hour are up 465 percent. Um, it's a it's a huge risk every time you go out there. I mean, I personally just might have been hit by a motorist, and um, we've had our vehicles struck, sides right, and everything else with all our lights on while working out there performing for the video. Well, and I understood. It's just that I have a, a, a real concern with the thought that traffic is decreasing, and we all know that it's increasing a hundredfold since the COVID thing. The oh, yeah. highway is busy, it's dangerous, and uh, we definitely have to address your concern on that highway. Well, and since last month I was out cleaning up garbage uh, between Gainesville and uh, Bass Hill, I can, I can attest to the danger involved or at least, you know, the real fear that you have is this car is by you. Um, so yeah, I think it's worthy of discussion. Do I have anybody else wishing to speak during public comment? Please. And you gotta identify yourself for the clerk. No, it's already on. Just mm -hmm. pull the pull it down yeah, a little bit so, so that we can hear you. There you go. I'm here today representing Jolly Elders in the Janesville. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but the building was built in 1909, so it's 110 years old. As far as we know, we go back 30 or 30 years or more, and we don't know of anything being done to that building. County owns it. The only thing we know that's been done was the roof put on it. We have a building to exist people. It's it's in real bad need of painting, and it's the paint's all peeling off, and um, it, it probably needs to be water blasted or something in our new painters. We've got windows on one side that are green and the windows on the other side that are blue. And um, unfortunately, when the, build, when the um, group started, they had 30 to 40 people. Well, now we're down to 15, and two of them are men, but one of them is severely really disabled, and the other one is disabled. None of us can get up on ladders to do stuff. Um, so we're asking if you guys can paint our building, since you own the building. <laughs> we take care of the outside, we take care of the inside, we've taken care of mice problems, we've taken care of all kinds of problems, and that's our job. We signed a contract saying that's what we do and we've been doing it. The problem is the county. They aren't doing their job. And I realize that money is the issue. Um, and we we would try to help we could beat you. <laughs> um, also we have a it's kind of like a trap door up up in the roofing in the attic area and the wind blew it off and so we could get the animals up in the attic and we need that fixed when they paint. If they paint <laughs> and the steps, the steps are peeing ahead, and 
And unfortunately, you guys were doing things in steps. We had one of our members about 25 years ago put the steps in for us because we couldn't take care of it any other way. We don't make any very much money. Um, and so we don't we just don't have the, the funding to take care of all this stuff. And um, we 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 worked hard at keeping the outside of the building <coughs> straightened out. We hire team challenge every year, they come out and they they rake and put all the you know, the raking at the back of the of the lot and um, at some point you're going to need that to go into. <laughs> so, um, but the steps are really, really in bad shape. I know I've fallen on them. And we have, um, almost all of us are all disabled in some way or other. And are on canes or walkers or, you know, are having trouble walking. And it's, it's just not right yet. And the last one, oh, I'll probably have to talk around. So, but we really appreciate it. We, you know, uh, we did talk to supervisors about it, and uh, Mr. Hensel did give us $750, but it's not enough to paint that building and to do like a power washing and everything that needs to be done. And, 110 years old. I think what you guys would look like if you went 110 years old. Probably washing as well. Power washing. No, the county the county appreciates the you know owning older buildings because it owns quite a few. Um, I mean you're sitting in one and it's very cold in here, uh, in part because it's on the list, I'm certain, but there's only so many things on the list. However, we don't want to ignore your, your concerns with problems. Uh, we already came on the matter. Um, owning an old building, I can personally attest, is an expensive proposition at times. So we're going to have to figure out some manner, not just for your building, but all the buildings in Lassie County. I think of the, the your uh, Veterans Hall up in Weaver. It's the same issue. Um, you know, they have their same, many of the same concerns that you do about their building. They have many of the same uses, um, and yeah, we're going to have to find a way in the coming future to take care of it. So, like I said, we appreciate your input today, um, and we'll see what we can do. Well, I'll call you back anytime. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> but, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also say that without some of these groups, I'm sure these buildings would be in much worse shape as well. So. We really appreciate the groups that do take care of the buildings. This one, I know Vesta Broadway has done a number of improvements, and uh, there's a lot more to do, but uh, they've put a lot of money into this particular building. I'm sure your building has been the same way, and, and the same up in Beaver and all those areas that uh, have it. Yeah, yeah, all the all yeah, different yeah, areas. So yeah, we appreciate every, that. Every, uh, every community we have a group in it that has a building that. We own the thing about it, they're there taking care of the buildings. And you know, there's only, I'll use Craig's term, there's only so many beans in the bag. So, right. okay. so thank you well, for your we, input today. We appreciate anything you can help us with. I have heard you might have some prisoners um, in that kind of stuff. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any prisoners. That's the <laughs> no prisoners in my basement. Nope. <laughs> Just sitting up here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you can get it. It's two more months. Um, does anybody else wish to speak during public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to unagendized report by board members. We'll start with Mr. Gallagher. I just want to thank all the voters of, of Lassen County, and uh, of course, we're, we uh, live in California where the votes can come in until who knows when, so we're still waiting for final results, but I appreciate the almost 80% uh, 
uh, turnout in our uh, election this year. And uh, I thank you today for that, for being for participating. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Albaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too would like to agree with Chris on everybody voting. It's our American right, and I appreciate the time that they took to go out and vote. It is very important, not only locally, but at the county, uh, at the state, and even the federal. It's very important to vote, it does matter, and I think you guys take the time to do that. It is a, it is a privilege, and I'm glad to see everybody that did that. Um, the only other thing I have is a group from RCRC came up, I forget when that was, last week, that's not easy. Um, anyway, Tony, I want to thank Tony and Warren for going up to that and looking at uh, maybe putting in a, a biomass uh, chip, pellet mill. Uh, they were looking at Modoc, Lassen, and Siskiyou County, so we kind of got to attend out Modoc this week to see where the cards are going to play out with that would be a huge asset for us. To the Moore State and get rid of the, one of the fire dangers, get rid of the biomass and protect the fuel out of the forest is going to be a, a huge win. Employment and housing and tax base is it's just going to be a win win for everybody. Other than that, that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Alba. Mr. Hammond. Um, next weekend, we start our cleanup cycle again. We're going to start with oil. Uh, next weekend, the following weekend, we'll begin furlough. We can't get into the public announcement on it about that. Which it does would be great. And then the week after, the first week of December, we'll be in Levitt Lake. Um, we've got a Sierra Alliance meeting. I think it's pretty successful. And I'd like to thank the supervisor elect, Jerry Bridges, for attending. Uh, Jeff Hemphill attended. Tony was in on it with Gene Clark and Richard. I believe that it's a, it's a, a catalyst to jump starting the economy in, in Lassen County in C95. And that was brought up in detail and also the female Alturas transmission line intertie, which will help us to get away from PGA. There's several big things on the plate in that group, and we're spearheaded by that group. So it's a community support group for Sierra uh, Army Depot. Um, I think uh, we're doing a good job of getting that thing rolling. And I have one question for Jenna. My Levitt Lake, well, where are we at? Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Oh, I stepped on you there. No, I'm just listening. I can see another power grab. Mr. Hemphill. Yeah, we had a transportation commission meeting yesterday, and we asked Caltrans for some information on the traffic, and we were pretty much appalled by Caltrans's answer that's saying that the traffic on 395 has been reduced. And I think all of us that live in this community can attest that it's, that's not the case at all. The traffic is getting heavier and heavier. And as we know, the road was, we had, was a terrible week last week on 395 as far as wrecks. And um, it's tragic and that we all need to push together to get this thing fixed. Um, Thursday, I have an EMS on board meeting with the Emergency Services Board with the uh, ambulance. And um, tomorrow was Veterans Day. And I want to thank all the veterans for what they did, their service. There's a rally that take place in Susanville, so hope to see you there. Thank you, Mr. Hemphill. I think um, part of what was so disturbing about the transportation meeting is that we are instructed to defer to the engineers, the good engineers at Caltrans, but at times it would appear that the engineers at Caltrans are no longer physical engineers, but instead they model everything on data. And so we are left with always facing the fact that we never reach their thresholds for what could be considered dangerous or deadly, and yet we know that physical engineering is often substandard in terms of um, what's needed for the road space. So I, I think that's what was so interesting that meeting yesterday so since you guys are talking about 395 real quick i i did contact uh, senator dolly's office yesterday in regards to the uh, 
the two fatality accidents that occurred and uh, asked, I, I told them that we had sent a letter sometime last year about increasing the speed for the trucks uh, to 65, getting some legislation to do that so there's not as much passing. And uh, they acknowledged that uh, they were gonna work on that, uh, but they said there wasn't a recommendation from Caltrans. As I recall from uh, the document that we got, that was one of the recommendations that Caltrans gave in their uh, initial study uh, to increase the, the, the truck traffic uh, to the same speed so there isn't as much passing. So I asked them to go back and look at that because I believe that that was a recommendation from one of the engineers initially, and that's why we wrote the letter last year uh, asking for that legislation. And I knew, know it would be uh, difficult legislation because there is no other place in California that has 65 mile an hour truck traffic uh, on the roadway, so it would take uh, a change in the vehicle code. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, they'll work on that and get something done. I mean, Supervisor Hemphill mentioned that yesterday in the so. In fact, I think it's brought up every time we talk about the you know, drive, but I'm glad you remind us because it should be brought up every time we talk about it. Was, was that, that was good for Supervisor Hemphill? That's right, we're on the uh, last one. No, um, I was going to say one more thing. I'm not going to be here next week. Just I'll, I'll be on vacation. Um, finally, I would like to speak to the election. Um, I can attest, in fact, I would love to be able to speak to our president at this moment. I can attest that at times the electorate makes decisions that we don't necessarily agree with. They might replace us with an older man um, or such, and we might not feel gracious about such things, but it is our duty and obligation under the Constitution to concede. Um, you don't have to be gracious about it, as Mr. Bridges can attest, I wasn't necessarily gracious at times, but. You simply have to concede that the voters have made their choice and move on. So with that, we will move on to the agenda. Um, and we will begin with um, item G1, the consent calendar. Does anybody wish to pull item G1? I have a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve by Gellar. Mr. Hammond seconds. Discussion. Please. Um, 
even without a structure. Um, it also would, if, they, if individuals have homeowner's insurance, it doesn't necessarily exclude them. There's still the opportunity to opt in and uh, possibly really, uh, utilize this program. And there's one other thing. The only other, uh, I think, important thing to consider is that it, uh, it will require county and some county staff to have um, Not a lot, but there'll have to be someone present at the properties that are being litigated um, during the process. If, uh, if this happens and the uh, Department of Property Services, um, let's say you ratify this right now, they'll most likely be doing work by the end of the week. Um, up this work today. Simon, she said that the 50 head of pine trees on your property get assistance in clearing them? Well, the way I understand it, and I'm not the expert, um, so it says here, um, if you don't have any burned structures, but you have burned trees, are you eligible for the tree removal in phase two? And it says you are. It says uh, if you have trees on property that are dead or likely to die within five years, as a result of the fire, you submit the right of entry form, and uh, they will, the state will use a certified arborist to determine whether the trees are going to die in those five years. Present that threat to Here's maybe where the key is: threat to public right of way, roadways, and public infrastructure, and uh, non-roadway infrastructure. So if you have 200 acres, and it's all yeah, probably out the center of. The and you're going to get you're going to be able to get your trees right on the road for them to make that. And the state will pay for that. Uh, that's how it reads here. But they're they're going to let the other trees sit and rot up to the landowner yeah. with no assistance whatsoever. Uh, that's the way I understand it. There may be other assistance out there, but uh, I don't know. Uh, that, that was the way I read it. I just wanted to clarify that. The, uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the people, individuals can still apply for assistance from FEMA. I, mean, I don't know what, all the programs that they have, but I don't think that's what the uh, is going to be using. I don't know if that would exist. Is, is, what, what's that process like? Never done it. Uh, it looks fairly straightforward to me um, based on the number of applicants. Um, it's an online process and then it gets audited at some point. I don't know what that looks like. I think the initial application is fairly straightforward. It's not egregious as to where people start doing it just say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is the federal government. <laughs> okay, yeah, any questions? So, so uh, on these trees you're talking about taking out, is the landowner, the state's going to come in, is the state going to pay to get them fell? And if so, without getting the exclusive point of paper, I'll just try to think. Can the landowner still salvage those trees by selling them to the mill? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I'm uh, familiar with the forest practice laws, although I'm not an expert. Uh, I could give you an opinion, but that's all it would be. Generally speaking, um, if you're removing timber um, for fire hazard, even light timber, fire hazard reduction or uh, landscaping, whatever, um, that's fine. You don't need a conversion permit, you don't need a harvest permit. Um, you, you're free to do that. Um, but really, where it starts to change is if you're, true, if you're truly doing that or converting, you're going to cut that tree down and you're going to convert the soil under it into something that would no longer grow a tree, then it would require a harvest permit. Second part of that is if it's if you're going to market it, sell it for anything, it would require a harvest permit. Um, so I would say yes, it would require a harvest permit, um, but not necessarily landowners. Um, the contractor, I think I'm speculating too much. I don't think it'd be helpful. Let, 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 let me help you a little bit, Silas. I, I did look into this and. Um, you can get an emergency harvest permit if your land has been burned, uh, uh, which is a pretty straightforward uh, process. The problem is, uh, depending on what property you have, whether you can get a contractor to come in and make it worth their while to, uh, or, to or take that. Or to take it. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that, was, that was kind of the problem with that fire, because you know, the land is so steep in, in places that the, the contractor won't go in there and take, take the wood because it wouldn't make it worth their while. Possible, I would say. 
Is it, is it possible with uh, phase one, the calculus that given the instruction, one of the four steps of the assessment there, to talk to those properly and say, hey, we're going to probably be in this next week, maybe not have a day and a time, but just so that they're notified so that they know, because I don't want to be the guy that says, you know, that passes this, and then all of a sudden we got strings turned around on Friday for the computer stuff. That's, that's why I wanted to make sure that we we're aware of how the program works. Um, yeah, I think that's possible. I think uh, we struggled to uh, notify them uh, even in the beginning. They're going to move as fast as they say they're going to move. Where's all this hazardous? Is it going to go to Grass Hill or is it going to go somewhere else? No, um, this phase one will go to a uh, certified hazardous waste place. And I don't know where that is, but that goes to Grass Hill. Uh, the phase two, some of it may go to Grass Hill. Who's going to pay for the Grass Hill? Is that That's all part of the state. Except the insurance part of it, that it still wouldn't be a cost to the, um, to the landowner. They're just their insurance, they, have, they may have to pay a portion of it, or, um, or once it reaches the limit, you know, if they have a debris removal rider within their policy, once you know, that's $2,000, their insurance may have to pay that first before the state picks up the rest of their cost. And then my last question is, is, is how does this program work in other communities? I'm thinking of Reading, North Paradise, et cetera. Yeah. Really are. Uh, but, Butte, Butte County, they, uh, I think they do this currently now with every fire they have. They, they're already, uh, Phoenix County, they just did their phase one on Monday, I think. Um, they, they're completed that within a few days. Butte County's already signed on to the program and they're participating in it. They, that was at the Old Paradise area. That was this program. So that was very large scale. Then to continue on, what about like the coal fire? Because there was four fire houses that burned up there. I don't know. Uh, it's been uh, silent on the gold and the hog fire. There's been there was zero discussion. Uh, I've asked a couple of times, and they say they're working on it. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, uh, who's this? Yeah, Dr. Corbett? No, Cal OES. Just in general. I mean, as of right now, the hog fire and gold fire haven't been approved for any disaster assistance at all. Um, so. The way I understand it, this program <coughs> applies to those whatever the state doesn't say that those qualify yet. I don't know what uh, what they're waiting on, what the decision is. Uh, maybe beneficial to contact uh, you know, people that you contact in Sacramento and see if they can help out with anything. So if we're going to do this with the hog fire, why can't we do the top program do the same thing for the gold fire too? Yeah. yeah. Yep, so I think, and that's what I'm saying is the state is saying right now, is saying the hog and the gold fire, they don't meet the qualifications for a state disaster assistance. So Dr. Corbett could write whatever he wants, but they're saying they don't meet the threshold to help you. Sorry. Even though we passed this today, you're still not going to do the issue with uh, the uh, state. No, the separate issue. This is for the sheep fire. Okay. So the sheep fire got state and federal disaster okay. assistance approval. The hog and the gold fire have. So what happens if you have property up there and you lose it because of a backfall? Well, who's, who's responsible for that? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I, there's a lot of immunities awarded to first responders uh, that allow for certain things. Um, Any of the damage though on the sheep fire would still, I mean, whether it's backfire or the main fire would still be covered under this program, correct? Yeah. I mean, there's a claims process. An individual could file a claim with the fire. I think the time frames are closed for that. Okay. Yeah, that'd be a good question for the legal counsel at the state level. Any, 
Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Silas. It seems like when we started this rodeo, we had a motion and a second. I don't know if that's true. That's correct. Do I have anybody else wishing to speak on this matter? Mr. Bridges. Gary Bridges. Hey, Silas, I just would like to put a bug in here and uh, push for reforestation when all this is all, all taken care of. Hate to see all that mountain washed down in these valleys. Thank Seems like we have the Forest Service coming back to speak to us in the next couple weeks. Thank you. Next week. So we'll certainly, that's an excellent point to make for them to get Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Please. You've got to state your name again. We're all over. I forgot to ask about liability. If we go out, if members of the club go out and try to do some of the work and we can't get anybody else to do it, um, don't you own the building to carry the liability? Well, that would depend on the contract that your organization has with, um, with the county. Um, if, if you're going to do any work, my advice to you is to notify Public Works ahead of that work just to make sure that they yes, understand. You guys? <laughs> well, I'm not Public Works. That would be um, 707 Street. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. If I may. Please. Would you ask uh, Madam Clerk to show the public comment this appeal? Yes. Yes, we can do that. No, you're good. Thank you. Now we'll go back to the item question on the agenda, if you want. We have a motion and a second. Uh, do I have any more comment on G1? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and call the motion. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next item on the agenda, H1, um, health and social services, community social services, authorization of application for and acceptance of the county allocation award under the transitional housing program. Grace, is that going to be you today? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Board of Supervisors. My name is Grace Four. I'm the housing program coordinator for community social services. I'm here today to talk to you about a funding opportunity through the transitional housing program. Pending a signed resolution, Lassen County has been allocated a second round of the transitional housing program funding. Um, we do refer to it as CHP. CHP is a program that is administered by the California Department of Housing and Community Development, um, otherwise known as HCD. In accordance with Senate Bill 80, Statute of 2019, Lassen County has been allocated $6,400. This allocation amount is the same as the round one allocation, um, which was approved by the board on May 19, 2020. Um, the purpose of this funding is to assist adults, young adults, age 18 to 25, with um, priority dementia, young adults who are experiencing the foster care system or this relationship. Um, use of the funding can include, but is not limited to, identifying and assisting with housing services, assisting and securing and um, maintaining housing, improving coordination of services and linkages to the community resources, and providing engagement to outreach in order to connect with the highest and most vulnerable. What did we do with phase one? So phase one has not yet been received um, because of the pandemic and the natural disasters and funding limited to those and some of the delay in the execution of standard agreements. So this funding will likely be um, combined with the first allocation. It's good because I remember Supervisor Alba made a comment on that one saying, is it worthwhile to take 4600 bucks? So now it's $9,200 that potentially we are going to have in the future. And so. Uh, the two allocations are actually 6400 I apologize if I said that incorrectly. So oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was 46 each. So maybe it was even worse than that. $12,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Although it's a little disturbing that the state hasn't released phase one. So yeah. that's a little obnoxious, but it's not your fault. Does anybody else have a question? 
Mr. Well, Alba. <clears throat> yes, because I agree with you. There was a bigger one and a smaller one. That's right. <laughs> but anyway, um, I want to go back. I want to dial in on this a little bit closer because even if you do $6,400, that's only $500 a month. And so I guess my question is, is how many 18 to 25 year olds uh, in Lassen County get this program? So it's hard to get a good number. I know it's going to fluctuate. But right, right. It, it is market. really difficult to get a good number because this population tends to not be counted at our point of time count because they are couch surfing. Um, they're often staying with friends and family or just are flying under the radar. Um, I can think of in the last, I'd say, month or so, um, four or five individuals that meet this um, category that are 18 to 25 that have had form of foster care. And serving the, um, the amount of money that would be needed for per individual just really varies. Um, we also try to help um, people who have low-income kids like subsidized housing. So that would um, mean that the amount of funds spent to house them is lower than the low of the cost of the deposits. Um, because the rent is already subsidized through another program. So it just really depends on, on what their needs are. You know, some individuals need to help raise, you know, a thousand dollars and others might need a little bit more than that. Is that for the year or for the month? So that so for example, if we got someone to a subsidized apartment, we would just need to pay the moving costs. We would pay a deposit which may be five or six hundred dollars, and maybe a utility deposit which might be another three hundred dollars. And then we would work to connect that person to other support services. And hopefully at that point it would be sustainable for just the, the moving costs. And if we look at that, that means that that one person is because we have a point in time count of about 120 or 140 individuals. One person is a meaningful percentage of that population. Uh, so it's why a program like this, even though it's a small dollar, um, is actually very effective. Because if we lose move one person from somebody's couch or the river to um, an actual home, then we have moved the needle on our particular homeless problem in a perceivable way. There are a lot of counties in California that don't have that option. They could move one person from you know, from no housing or poor housing to a step up and you wouldn't notice. But here, that is gonna have a noticeable effect. In fact, I can speak, I don't know how many are couch surfing or what the population of 18 to 25 is, that um, what it is compared to our point in time. But three weeks ago when I was walking on the river, I saw one person in the tent that had to be between the ages of 18 and 25. And if we could get that person first, Well, my next question is in the background, we have four bullet points. And I guess my question is, is what percentage of the funds you anticipate to go to each one of those bullet points? Again, it depends on the needs of the individual. Um, so some of our time will be spent, some of the funds I would imagine would be spent on staff time, um, helping that individual secure housing. Um, I would say the majority of the funds would be spent on the second total. Um, securing and maintaining housing, that's paying for the deposits and the personal care or um, ongoing rent if necessary. And where would you see, how would you rank those first, second, third, fourth? Again, <clears throat> yeah, that's hard to predict, but I would say the second bullet would be number one. Um, perhaps the first bullet would be the second. Um, and then the third bullet would be three, and then the fourth bullet four. You know, I bring all this up, and I mean, the, the amount of money we're getting, and I agree with you, I mean, every, every little bit helps, because we're, some of these kids have got a, a bad hand dealt to them, and they're trying to make the best of their job, and they're getting this help. At the same time, though, I mean, if we're going to have to do this, you know, why don't they give us some money that's going to be able to do some good? If, if the way this is, you get $64 per year, and have the, the state, Approved, said we could do this way back when, back in May, and we still haven't got the money for it. You know, to, to me, all this stuff is is just to make somebody feel good. Go, I developed this program, but that's fine. We developed the program, but where, where's the money supposed to implement this? We haven't even got it since May. Now we're going to do this again in December. We still haven't got any money for it either for the first one. We did back in May, so 
And all this is, it's a program that makes somebody feel good, like they're doing something, but they're really not because they haven't got to know the person. And we get this money, it's $550 a month. You've got to take some of your costs out of it to pay for it. For you and your time and your staff. But we're, we're going to go back, let's get to the kids that actually need it. And that's why I said on that smaller laptop, just give it back to the state because it's not even worth our time and effort. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of almost the same way to this. I mean, this is silly. So I, I do understand where you're coming from. We do have other grants that we can put the money good with. We have a grant that allows us to do um, outreach and emergency services that has a youth set aside. So what might happen with these two grants is that we would use that grant for our case management and initial outreach and connection. And then this grant could be used just for um, the housing costs. So we're combining it with some of the other small grants that we have received that we're currently spending. Um, and on the state's behalf, we have gotten other funding from them related to COVID-19 that they have prioritized. So they've just had a lot of other funding priorities related to those state disasters. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're going to send Grace to talk to the legislature about this particular bill. <laughs> No offense, Grace. I'm sure you do a fine job. The whole thing just needs to be highlighted. I mean, they got priorities, but yet they put down stuff on Dean and, and the county and whatnot, and they expect us to go and get Johnny on the spot. But yet, they can drag their feet as long as they want. I mean, we're six months out. And they just don't got funding for the first one of these groups. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. The only other thing I would add in regards to the amount, um, the allocations are determined based on the number of youth in our foster care and probation system that met the state requirement. The state did allocate $8 million across the state. This is the amount that our county was allocated. It'd be sort of like if you had a community building and you noticed that it never got any work at the county because it didn't fit in the, into the budget. So we're that small community building in Janesville. That's why we understand how they're feeling. Do we have any other comments or questions? I move to approve. I got a motion from Mr. Hemphill. Second. Second from Mr. Hammond. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think that was a yes, though. I think that was a 5 0 yes, Grace. <laughs> nice work. Thank you. Well, that brings us this extensive agenda today um, to H2, Rules of Note. We're going to have a regular meeting again. Is that what you're saying? Well, um, that entirely depends on the wisdom with which you approach this item. Oh, <laughs> your microphone. <laughs> yeah, nobody heard you, like, like, your microphone. Oh, good. I'm not saying that a second time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, H2 is an effort. You know, we've been having special meetings since COVID hit out of the board chambers. Ever, you know, our rules have said all our regular meetings happen in board chambers. Uh, and uh, if it's somewhere else, it does, therefore, ergo, hence, is a special meeting. So every meeting, essentially, we've been calling a special meeting. You know, I, I probably a little late getting to it, but uh, uh, why don't we build a little flexibility into our rules of notice and procedure, whereby uh, we designate, you know, we must, as a matter of state law, uh, have our, our regular meetings in the county seat. Uh, and that is also set forth in the county code doesn't say where in the county seat. So any of the locations that I have set forth in the proposed amendment contemplate a location in the county seat, uh, whether it be here uh, or um, the classic chambers that we attend or Jensen Hall or any other location that the chair designates uh, and is noticed appropriately according to the Brown Act uh, the agenda published for that purpose. Where's that county seat again? Ah, yes. Most of your district. Uh, which, which what's the location called? The location. Yeah. It's it's an area. The city, it's the of, city of Susan. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we forget uh, that every county. All I have done in furtherance of trying to make this change is make an amendment to section two A at the bottom of page one. That's the only section. Well, I won't say the only section, uh, but the only substantive section. There's one other little place at the tail end of the proposed uh, uh, the amendment to the proposed rules or whatever proposed amendment that contemplates uh, rescission of the existing set in order to enact this set. Uh, but 
But that is it right there in 2A. I don't know if you all have any questions, but uh, pretty straight up. Gentlemen, any questions? I did speak with Supervisor Gallagher about one other possible amendment, uh, and I look forward to preparing that language for it. First meeting in January adoption, even though I'll be absent, uh, and uh, it's very straightforward. But it wasn't agendized for that uh, today, uh, so I'm reluctant to take it up. I'm certain you'll be there in spirit. So. Yeah, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, one thing I like to say is, <clears throat> Bob, I think this is a, a smart move, and I think you got it well founded. The first thing to the first amendment, and you can move forward with two things. That's a motion. Second. All ball moves, handful of seconds. Any public discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Any information for the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Egan? No, Mr. Chairman. A strange meeting where we didn't hear from you all at all. <laughs> um, with that, then I suppose we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.